Aaron Brown, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, it's always lovely to see your face. You just wrote a POV essay for CBC Sports and you titled it, The Track and Field Business Model Needs an Overhaul. I wanna start there. What feedback are you hearing from the athletic community? Yeah, uh, first of all, thanks for having me. Good to see your face as well. Uh, um, the feedback I've got from a lot of athletes and even coaches and people just involved in the sport itself it was very positive. A lot of them have said all good things and that, you know, they're finally happy that someone said something and, and articulated the points that they wanted to say, but didn't quite know how to say it or were afraid to say it for fear of blowback. But honestly, what I what I said, I don't I don't think was anything controversial. I've been a professional for eight years now. So I've seen the ins and outs. I've seen a lot of people come and go and I've seen how the business has developed. And I just feel like there's a lot we can do to improve it. And there's a lot of untapped potential in this sport. And it's unfortunate that a lot of people um, aren't able to fully take advantage of it because of the way it's structured. You said you were a professional for eight years. When was the exact moment that you kind of thought track and field athletes are undervaluing uh, themselves? The moment, I mean, even before I was professional, I've been in the sport since, you know, 2010, 2011. Like I wrote in the piece, there's no real distinction between who's a professional and who's not. Like it's just kind of all, all intermingled. And I think that is where a lot of issues come and arise because if you can't distinguish between who's professional and who's not, you have people who kind of water down the sport and you don't know exactly where to allocate the assets. And so the people at the top are always going to get taken care of. The rich are always going to get richer. But like, like I said, there's a tier below that of high class elite athletes where you see some of them who are able to make a living and some who aren't. But it's like, if you look at other sports comparably, they should be on the same, they should be on par. They should be able to support themselves and not having to resort to GoFundMes and raising funds just to, you know, try and pay for their day-to-day -day, uh, activities as an athlete. Yeah, I love it. I mean, you said you don't watch the NHL just when a player scores a hat trick. Um, yeah. I thought that was yeah. a brilliant point. It's obviously created a lot of conversation. What are some of the solutions and ideas that you're hearing from others um, to boost that value proposition? Yeah, um, you know, I, I raised some in the article. I, I, I think a huge market is gambling and uh, fantasy sports in particular. Like if you look at the NFL or the NBA, like a lot of people tune in literally just for the aspect of money, like who doesn't like money. And when you know you have money on the line, you're going to care a lot more about the outcome of the, the races. So I feel like that's a huge mark that we could tap into. Um, but the key thing is, I feel like whatever idea comes up, because there's there's been ideas that have come up through the years. But what happens is there's no patience behind it. But when people come to the sport and try a new idea, they expect it to have an immediate return. If it's not, they pull the plug. And nothing's ever going to change if that's the motto. Everyone's going to just revert to the mean, go back to what's traditionally worked, and nothing's going to change. You talked about raising the stakes and kind of the drama and tension and head-to-head -head races. I think of, of course, Donovan and Michael. I mean, I remember watching yeah. that on TV. Um, yeah. Was there a golden age to track and field? And, you know, I think about Donovan and the bravado and, and you know, um, mm -hmm. just the egos that would present themselves on the line. And we don't see that as much in present day track mm -hmm. from my from my perspective. Is right. there is there something there? I think so. And the fact that that resonates with you, you know, years later, uh, that was I think that race was in the 90s. Yeah. Um, I, I would say that was around the golden age, like the 80s, 90s. And they could just go into the circuit and be able to support themselves from the races because everybody knew at least you're coming with some money, um, whether they're first or last. And this that's just, it's not the case anymore. If you look at the payout of a Diamond League race, last place is like $500 now. What are you going to do with that, especially when it's getting taxed and you have to pay your agent? I definitely feel like head-to-heads is something that could definitely bolster the sport. It definitely adds a lot of excitement. It allows you to um, get to know the athletes. Like if you go into their background, their lead-up, and what's what's happening, kind of like boxing how we do with USC fights and, and hype it up. People will just accept the status quo and leave it at that and say, oh, there's no opportunities. There's no money in track, but I've seen it. And I know firsthand that it can work. The, this, the product is good. It just needs help with presentation and some innovation. So from your perspective, where can that ne needle move the most? 
Um, man, <laughs> it's hard to know where to start because there's there's just so many elements across the board. But I, I really think that the, the the very first thing that needs to happen is a collectified voice um, representing the athletes. And then we could bargain between the athletes and the governing bodies of the sport. If you look at what happened with the NCAA, they used to be an amateur sport the entire time. And even though NCAA football, NCAA basketball were billion dollar industries, the athletes were making nothing. But now, you know, you would once upon a time think that would never change, but now they're, they're able to make money off their likeness with NIL deals. Why can't we do something similar with the IOC in the Olympics? You know, like that's a billion dollar industry. We have like the, the penultimate event of our sport is always going to be the Olympics. Yet that's the one that we make the least from, you know, that, that kind of has to change. If we're going to have our championship be or like the, the highest at the highest level, the Olympics, there needs to be some type of profit from that from, that's uh, shared with the athletes beyond just, you know, oh, you get your recognition and you're on TV and, you know, you pe- might get sponsors or whatever the case may be. We need to actually make money from the Olympics itself. It's, it's, I don't feel like the onus should fall on the shoe companies or the governments like AC, or whatever. I think the actual sport governing body itself, World Athletics, should be responsible for at least providing a sustainable environment for elite level athletes. And I don't think that's a big ask because that's what all the other sports do. And I feel like the way to start is to have somebody advocating on our behalf so that we could partner with the governing bodies and figure out ways that we could push the sport together, work together in harmony so that we grow the sport and make it more of an actual professional sport. Because right now we're operating like an amateur sport. 